Y'all ready to dive in the Word? I'm going to go ahead and open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians 3. And I I just want to uh, talk this morning about being rooted in big love. On rooted in big love. Um, I want to read this prayer that Paul prayed in Ephesians 3, 16. If you're newer to your Bibles, Ephesians is in the New Testament. Um, Get through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then you'll shortly after that, you will come to the little book of Ephesians. Paul is writing to this church, and he's, he's letting us in on how he prays. I think one of the great things to do if you want to learn to be a great prayer is to learn from great prayers, right? To see how they prayed. How did Paul pray? And he, he's going to share with them how he prayed for them. And this prayer, I'll, I'll explain in just a moment, but this prayer had a huge impact on me this week. Um, verse 16, Ephesians three sixteen says this, I'm reading from the NIV, it says, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. How many know it's not our strength, it's his strength? We need that every day. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and I pray that you, being rooted and established in what? Love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp How wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with the measure of all the fullness of God. I I, I think it's interesting that he said, I want you to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Kind of of an odd statement, isn't it? I I want you to know something that can't be known. Um, and he, and he says, the, in other words, you can't know it just by reading about it. When he's talking about the love of God, he says, you, you don't just get it by reading books about it. I don't think you get it just by reading the Bible alone. Um, it, it's, it's something you don't, listen, you don't get it just by listening to sermons about it. In fact, he says, the only way you can fully grasp how wide, how deep, how long, how high is the love of God is for him to fill you with it by his spirit. And he said, that's my prayer. I've tried to explain it to you. I've tried to teach you about it. I wrote you 1 Corinthians 13, a whole chapter about love. I wrote to you about it, but I still, I'm praying for you that you would grasp it, that you would get it, that you would uh, be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. Um, This uh, impacted me profoundly this week. I I was actually on on a Tuesday. Um, I did uh, Jerry C.'s funeral and, and this family's here. Uh, today, come on, stretch out your hands toward them right now. John, Mac, and Josh, and Donna, and Tom, and this family. Uh, Jerry C., uh, 24 years old, um, passed away uh, a, a week ago. Tragic, tragic. And so, would you just stretch out your hands toward them? Father, we thank you for this family. God, we pray your continued grace and mercy every day. God, strength that only you can give. And God, I just pray that you heal and comfort and help. Uh, every day. And God, we thank you for the hope that we have in you. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 They need a church family more than ever, right? Right now. And uh, so, but I was, I was preaching Jerry's funeral and um, got to this point. I was talking about the prodigal son, but I wasn't talking about the son. I was focused on the father and how much the father loved and how when the father saw the son a long way off, how he ran to him, how he embraced him, how he covered his nakedness, how he... And as I was just reading the passage, all of a sudden it was like um, I was overwhelmed. And listen, I've been doing funerals for 20 years. I've done a lot. I did my dad's funeral. And I've never experienced anything quite like this. And... and um, Overwhelmed to the place that I didn't think I was going to be able to finish. And um, just kind of struggled through it, thinking, well, we should have stopped with Coley, because Coley did a great job. And I was like, well, we should have just stopped right there. Um, and so the next morning in, in my devotional time, I was just in prayer and reading the Bible and just my daily passage that I was reading. And, and I was like, God, what was that about? I mean, I know that. And, and my passage that I read that morning was here in Ephesians 3.16, that where Paul was praying, and he says, it's my prayer for you that you'd be rooted and grounded, established in love, and that you would grasp just how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is my love. And he said, what you were experiencing is how much I love him. 
how, how much I love everybody. And, and can I just tell you this, that I've never felt it. I, I mean, even when I got saved, I didn't feel it like that. And it was just this, and, and he, he said that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. He said, I want you to feel love for people like I feel love for people. And can I tell you, I had to say, like, God, I've, that's about all I can handle. I don't think I can handle any more of the fullness of what you, you experience. And so um, that's my prayer today is that we, would, that we would be rooted. In other words, he says that you would be rooted in love, in big love. So that's the name of the message, that we would be rooted in big love. Because if the root is good, the fruit is good, Right? And, and, and so if we want good fruit, we need a good root. And so he uses two words. He talks about being rooted in love and being established in love. Rooted is a horticultural term, right? It, it speaks of the roots of a tree. But, but established speaks about a foundation. And it's the same word that was used when Jesus tells the story about the man who built his house upon the rock. And he said, when the storms came, come on, the winds came, the rain came. He said, that house would stand because it was established. And he, he's, he's saying here, here's my prayer for you, church, is that you would be rooted in his love so that you'll bear good fruit and that you'll be established in your, his love so that whenever, whatever trial comes, however hard you get hit, that you'll be established in this fact of just how rich, how deep his love is for you and for others. He wants us established in big love. Amen. And so, so if you're rooted and established in big love, then the fruit of your life will be big love. Come on, if we, if we don't love big, it's just because we got it. we're not rooted good. We're, we're not established good. And we, instead of focusing on trying to fix the fruit issue, we need to fix the root issue. That the root issue is, why don't I love people more? It's because you're not, we're not established and rooted in His love. And the answer for that is, God, would you fill me with your love? Help me to comprehend, help me to grasp just how, how big, big love is. I love these adjectives that he uses to describe God's love. He says, it's wide, it's long, it's, it's high, it's deep. Those are great words. He says, I want you to grasp it. It's, I love that word. It's, it's, it's high love. Come on, bring me a higher love. Somebody ought to make a song about that. I mean, that, that's, it's high love. I thought of Zacchaeus in Luke 19. You know, Zacchaeus was a man of high. He was short, but he had high a position. And yeah, I won't sing that one. Um, you Baptists know it, though, don't you? <laughs> but Jesus entered Jericho, and he was passing through. It says, a man there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy, and he wanted to see who Jesus was. But because he was short, he could not see over the crowd, so he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And when the Savior passed that way, he said, Zacchaeus, what? I couldn't, I couldn't help it. It just comes out. <laughs> I can rap it for sure. I guarantee you that. <laughs> and when, but when Jesus reached the spot, the Bible says he looked up. Come on, he looked up. He saw him in his high position. Here was this man who, who in uh, status-wise, he had a high position. He was wealthy. He had money. He had a great house. Come on, he had a great... Uh, it said that he was the chief tax collector. But if you knew how he got there to this position, the way that he climbed to the top to get to that height. Uh, if you knew anything about tax collectors, um, that they, they were people that would do people wrong. They would climb over people. They did whatever they, they did to get to the top. When, when you owed taxes, if you owed $1,000 in taxes, they would tell you you owed 1200 and they would pocket the two, and then they would give the 1000 That's how they made a living. Anything you collect over the tax is yours. And so he was a shark. Y'all watch Shark Tank? He, he, he sharked his way to the top. Didn't have many friends, but he had a great house. And so now Jesus sees him. And the Bible just, that when the people saw Jesus look at him and go high with his love. Come on, he went high with his love and said, hey, come on down to that tree. I'm coming to your house today. 
He said, I'm coming for a meal. And he's like, I wasn't planning a meal. And he said, well, you are now. We're having a party, my friend. Come on, Jesus was bringing a house party over to Zacchaeus' house and invite your friends. Come on. And the only friends he had was tax collectors. They weren't even really his friends, but he was their boss, so they had to come. And, and so he came, and he was just overwhelmed by high love. And all the religious people, all the, all the people were like, that's too high. Come on, look at Jesus hanging out with sinners and tax collectors. But Jesus loves big. Well, aren't you glad that he, he was just a good old sinner? Zacchaeus. He's just a good old sinner, but aren't you thankful Jesus loves just good old sinners? That he loves high. He's not just the down and out, but the up and out. Come on, we all need Jesus, amen? amen. But his love's not only high, it's wide. Um, people didn't like Jesus because he loved Zacchaeus. Um, but the same was true. He loved wide. Think about the Samaritan woman. You know the story, the woman at the well. And Jesus, Jesus said, oh, I've got to go to Samaria. Now, the thing about Samaria is other Jews would go around Samaria. If they were here and needed to get here, they would go around Samaria. And Jesus said, no, I have to go there. I and the King James says, I must needs go to Samaria. Who talks like that? But you can tell that he's saying, listen, I have to go because he loves wide. And, and this woman had three strikes against her. If you know the story, she was a Samaritan, which was looked down upon. It was a, a racial issue, is a Samaritan. She was a woman, which was looked down upon in that culture. And the third is that she had been married five times, and she's now living with someone who's not her husband. We don't know why. I was talking with Ray Deason yesterday, and he brought up a great point. He said, we don't know why she had been married five times. Maybe they all died. We don't know. I just always assumed that she was just not easy to live with. You know, and she kept thinking, there's got to be a better one, you know, and, and uh, but the reality is if she'd have been divorced that many times, probably um, she would have already been put away by then. Um, so, but she was, listen, we can all agree, she was a hurting, she was hurting five husbands, living with one now, de dejected, she was coming to get water in the middle of the day at noon, the hottest part of the day, because she was an outcast. Maybe you can identify through someone who's been hurt, but Jesus loved wide. And even his disciples didn't get it. When they, when they saw Jesus talking to her, they're like, why, why is he talking to a Samaritan woman? They didn't know the rest of the story, but she already had three strikes against her, but Jesus loves wide. Come on, aren't you thankful for big love this morning? He goes on, and, 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 and I think about not only wide love, but uh, someone who, a great story in the Bible of, of love where God loves deep and wide is the story of Jonah. And Jonah is a great little book. Listen, if you want to say you've read a whole book in the Bible, just go read the book of Jonah. It's four chapters. You can read it in 30 minutes, one setting. Get the whole story. I love the story. It shows God's love in the Old Testament. How I many know we all know Jesus loves, but we wonder about that Old Testament God. But he's the same God. And he shows how, how deep and how wide his love is in the book of Jonah. Because in the book of Jonah, there was this city uh, that wasn't a Jewish city. They were, they were Gentiles. They were like us. And it says they, they were an extremely wicked city. I mean, you th think Las Vegas, whatever you want to think. Sin City, we'll call them. And, but they had 120,000 souls in that city. And that's how God described it. There's 120. He didn't just say 120,000 people, 120,000 dirty, rotten sinners, 120,000 wicked people. He said there's 120,000 souls there in Nineveh. Jonah 1.17. I'm sorry, Jonah. Um, where am I? 1. Verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of uh, Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. Look at verse 3. But Jonah ran away from the Lord, headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa when he found a ship bound for that port. And paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. See, I want you to see how wide God's love is. Here's a wicked city that he's going to have to punish, but he doesn't want to punish them. So he wants to send Jonah there to tell them I love them. Tell them that if they'll turn to me that I don't want to punish them. And his love was wide, but his love was too wide for Jonah. See, Jonah was a religious guy. He, he actually was a man with a prophetic gift, but he didn't have God's heart. 
And, and so when God said, I want you to preach to them, I want, you, I, I want them to repent so I don't have to judge them, Jonah didn't want them to repent. Come on, he, he thought they deserved judgment. And he's like, I know you, God, you're compassionate and you're kind. And if I go and tell them how good you are, they'll repent and they don't deserve it. They deserve judgment. Come on, religious people want God's love and mercy and grace for themselves, but they want law and justice for everybody else. Come on, check yourself on that. And so what did Jonah do? He ran in the opposite direction, gets on a boat going the opposite direction and goes far from God. Because God's love is just too wide. It, it, his love was wider than Jonah was willing to go. So he said, I'm going to have to get outside of the realm of the width of his love. So he goes in the opposite direction. God sends a storm, prepares a storm just for him. Ends up, the boat starts to get covered in water and filled up with water. And so, it, you know the story, they take Jonah, they throw him overboard. God prepared a big fish to swallow Jonah. Hey, listen, I believe that's true. I, I believe the Bible is true from Genesis to maps. I, I believe it's true. There's some people who are like, well, that's impossible. Exactly. That's what God does. But if you, if you say that that part's not true, then you have to try to figure out the virgin birth. Come on, the resurrection, the creation. I mean, you know, we serve a God who does the impossible. And, and so God, it doesn't say that it was possible for it to happen. It says God prepared a fish. I remember hearing a story about, uh, in fact, I just heard it again the other day about this, this kid who went to school, and they were talking about, what would you do this summer? I went, to, I went to Bible school. They said, well, what would you learn? I learned about Jonah and the whale. Jonah was in the belly of a big whale for three days, and the teacher said, well, that's impossible. That can't happen. It can't, it's not even possible to live in the belly of a whale for three days. How did, how did, you want to explain to me how he did that? And the kid was like, I don't know. When I get to heaven, I'll ask him. I'm like, well, what if he doesn't go to heaven? Said, well, then you can ask him, right? <laughs> Come on, that's funny right there. You know, it's uh, <laughs> so true. But I believe it's true. And that however God did it, he was in the belly. Notice Jonah 1.17. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So, so Jonah... I mean, the Ninevites were just your typical wicked, ungodly people, didn't know God. Jonah is your typical disobedient believer, running from God, knows better, knows what God wants to do, but is just choosing to go the other way. Want anybody relate to that? I know, I know what that is. I, I've, I've done that. I, know, I knew what God was, wanted and ran from the plan of God and found myself in my own whale-like situation, but come on, aren't you thankful that God's love runs deep? He's got deep love, and he was, he was deep in the belly of the whale. When he was deep in the sea, and it says, Jonah 2, verse 1, it says, From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God, and he said, In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. Come on, how many of you are thankful for deep love? That, that God, even when he was rebellious, even when he did, how many know God could have found somebody else? He could have picked anybody else, but he didn't give up on Jonah. He loved Jonah. Even in his rebellion, he loved him. He didn't quit on him. And how many know Jonah was stubborn? I mean, I'm stubborn. I know that. But come on, three days and three nights. I'm pretty sure first day when I realized I was still alive in the belly of a well, I'd be like, all right, you got me. I mean, come on, y'all. Three days, three nights. What's he waiting on? That's how much he didn't want to do it. Although sometimes we can relate because sometimes God allows one thing to happen, one storm, another storm, another situation, and all these things trying to get our attention, and, and we still won't respond to his deep love. But God finally, he, 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 Jonah gets it, and he cries out to God, and so you know the story, the, the, the fish spits him out on the bank. I bet he was a sight, right? <laughs> He's walking around Nineveh, preaching, repent, doesn't want him to do it. Imagine that message. Y'all are all going to hell. 
And somehow it got to their heart. And 120,000 people repented and cried out to God. And God saved them in spite of Jonah. And in fact, even when they repented, he was mad. Come on. He, he was obedient. See, this is another sign of religious. You might be obedient, but you still don't have the heart of God. And so he, he obeyed what God did or what he wanted. But notice in, in Jonah verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 2, he says, um, he's mad at God because they got saved. And he says, Lord, isn't this what I said when I was still at home? Isn't this why I tried to forestay by fleeing to Tarshish? I knew that you're a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Come on, that's our God. That's deep love. And sometimes it's God's love is just a little bit too deep and too wide. We want it for ourselves, but sometimes it's just too big for somebody else. And, and Jonah was one of those who had experienced God's love. And in fact, he had some of God's gifts, but he didn't have his heart. Paul, Paul warns about this in 1 Corinthians 13. You know, 1 Corinthians 12 is the gifts chapter. It gives the nine gifts of the Spirit and power gifts and all this. And 1 Corinthians 14, he talks about how to use them in church, what to do, what not to do, the guardrails for using the gifts. But then 1 Corinthians 13, he gives the heart. And Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 13, 1. He says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but if I don't have love... I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Well, in other words, if, if, I'm, if I'm operating in the gifts and the supernatural, but if I'm not doing it with God's heart, it's just a bunch of noise. It doesn't, it, you're not representing me well. He says, or if I have the gift of prophecy, like Jonah, and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but I don't have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and, 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 I, and I work at the food pantry and I serve and I, I, do, I work at food distribution and I'm constantly giving and I give my body over to hardship. Uh, he said, but if it's not done in love, it's nothing. See how big of a deal it is? He says, if it's bad root, it's tainted fruit. It may look good. Come on, we bought some peaches the other day. They look good. I couldn't wait, got home, sliced me a little piece off that peach. Come on, five nasty peaches. They, they were all bad. <laughs> looked good, looked good on the outside. And, and he's saying, look, you religious, we, we can look good on the outside. We can be doing good things and even spiritual things and all these things. But come on, we have to be rooted in big love. And that's why Paul prayed for the Ephesians. I want you to grasp God's love. I want you to know it. I want you to be filled with his love so you can serve others. Amen? When God's love is high, it's wide, it's deep. And then finally, he says this, that God's love is long. Now, long can mean duration. I was thinking about this. I, thought, I think about the, the nation of Israel. Look how God has loved them a long time. All the way back thousands of years ago, he chose Abraham and said, I love you, man. I've chosen you, chosen your people. And, and God, through, through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and, and, and through Jacob, the 12 tribes, God's just blessing. His heart was for them. He, he, they were the apple of his eye. And how many times through the centuries have they, have they walked away from God and served other gods, yet he kept loving them? And listen, can I tell you this? Even after rejecting Jesus for the most part as their Messiah, he still loves them. Come on, you read the book, he's still got a plan for them. And I believe soon the gospel is going back to the Jews to the point where it says that they will recognize the one they pierced. Come on, the one that they put on a cross. And he says that all Israel will be saved. Come on, how many know that's long love? After all this happened, he still loves long. And Israel is a great example of how he, he, he loves, how he loves you. He's loved you a long time. Before you were even born, he had a plan for your life. And so it speaks of duration, but it also can be distance. That he loves those who are a long way off. And the Bible calls the Gentiles, the, the Jews were the near ones, but he loved us who were afar off. In Mark chapter 4, I'll close with this story. I, I think it's a, an amazing story of Jesus' long love. Come on, everybody say big love. 
Long love. Verse 35 says, on the same day, he had just uh, ministered to multitudes of people. Jesus did. And it says, on the same day when evening had come, he said to his disciples, let us cross over to the other side. And when they left the multitudes, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats also went with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already feeling. Come on, it's the uh, Sea of Galilee uh, uh, from one side to the other, you know, two or three hours to get from one side to the other. It's not a huge body of water, but come on, have you know in two or three hours against a windstorm, that's a little different. Becky and I were in Florida last time we were there. We decided to go on a bike ride. We love to ride bikes, and just we rent some bikes and just go on a bike ride and have some fun. And so we're riding bikes, and it was super windy that day. I mean, super windy. And, and so when the wind was at our back, we were just having an amazing time. We were flying, and like, look at us. Look how great a shape I'm in. And, and then we decided, we, uh, hey, uh, TJ Maxx is only like two miles away. We need some groceries. And so we decided to go to TJ Maxx on a bike about two miles, which is nothing on a bike. And so we're heading that way. And But we were going against about, what, 300-mile-an-hour wind, something like that. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what it was, but it was faster than I was pedaling. And I've never in my life been in a situation where I was pedaling and I wasn't moving. I, I mean, it was just, I was mad. I, I was just like, and Becky is like, if she starts something, she's going to finish it. You just got to know that. And so if we've trekking to, we're getting to TJ Maxx, and I'm thinking, you can go. I'm calling an Uber. I mean, I don't care. I'll strap it to the hood. But... I stayed with her, and um, we about died on that trip <laughs> going to TJ Maxx on a bike, but it was because the wind was against us. And so, listen, what I want you to see there is that this was a long trip that they were actually going for one person, but it was even harder because the wind was against them and the storm was against them. But this is long love. And big love. And it says in Mark 5, it says, When they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. Come on, long love. These people were far from God. They they were raising pigs over there. Jews don't do that. They're raising pigs over there. He's in the graveyard. This is just all kinds of things that they don't go there. This is long love. It says, They went to the country of the Gadarenes, and when he'd come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit who was, had his dwelling among the tombs. No one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains. And the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. Well, this is a hopeless situation. We've seen people in high situations and just good old sinners. We've seen wicked people. We've seen rebellious people. We've seen, we've seen people that are hurting people. And Jesus' love was big enough for all that. But come on, this is a hopeless situation. And, and this is a man that nobody can help. Everybody's tried helping him. They couldn't help him, so they just chained him up. But he was, he had, this guy had at least 2,000 demons in him. And, and one of the, if you've ever encountered anybody with the demonic, um, oftentimes you see unusual strength with one demon. This guy had 2,000 demons. He's cutting himself. He's day and night. The Bible says always, day and night, night and day, crying out, no peace, no rest, cutting himself with stones. Come on, young people, whoever, that, that cutting yourself stuff, you know, whatever to hide your pain or whatever, hide your hurt. Listen, that, that, is, that is of the devil. That's, what they, that's, that's demonic. That's what the devil wants you to do, to kill, to destroy, to. But have you know Jesus gives hope? And this was a hopeless situation. They had tried everything. Nothing can help. He's breaking the chains. He's angry. There's no peace. He's full of demons come on and if you need if you're if you're full of demons you don't need discipleship by the way you need deliverance you jack hayford used to say it this way he said you can't disciple a demon and you can't cast out the flesh right so if it's a flesh issue we got to crucify it we need to walk in the power of the holy spirit 
But if it's a demon, it's got to go. Right? And we're spirit, soul, and body. No, no demon can get in your spirit. That's sanctified, set apart, holy. But in your body, you, you can invite things in. They don't have any right there. They don't have any control there. But if you invite them in, they'll be happy to come. That's true. Can a Christian get drunk? They can't, can a Christian get... I mean, is it possible? I'm not saying is it okay. I'm saying is it possible for a Christian to get drunk? Well, how does that happen? They, they take something into their body, a spirit, right? It's not a spirit, but it's what they call it. Into their body that affects them. Did it affect their spirit? No. But did it affect their body? Yes. But they invited it in. Listen, you invite an evil spirit, he'll be happy to come in and mess up your life. And that can't be discipled out. It's got to be cast out. Right? Y'all study that. Check that out. This man needed deliverance. But Jesus loves big. And he comes to set the captives free. And he's, he loves long for the hopeless cases. I love it. And it says, when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and he worshipped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, what do I have to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, come out of the man, unclean spirit. And then he asked him, what is your name? And he answered and saying, my, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he also begged him earnestly that he would not send him out of the country. And now a large herd of swine had been feeding there near the mountains. And so all the demons begged Jesus, saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. And then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000. And the herd ran violently down to the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. Well, that's why they say you had 2,000 demons, because there were 2,000 swines, and they went into all of them. And they all ran and drowned in the sea. You see, when you see Jesus' big love, I want you to grasp it. I want you to grasp it, how, how deep it is, how long it is, how, the depths that Jesus will go to, to, to bring freedom uh, to people's life. And, and what I want you to see is that when we're rooted in big love, we experience big change. Well, I, I want to see more change in people's lives. Come on, I, I want to see people free. I want to see people growing. Uh, and, and, and I believe that, that part of the reason we don't see more fruit is because we, we just were not rooted in big love. Because he said, if you're rooted in big love, we're going to experience big change. We saw it with Zacchaeus. Come on, what happened after he was experienced high love from Jesus? What did he do? It, it says that, that, that Zacchaeus went and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here now I give half of my possessions. Remember, he was the tax collector. He was the one that got over on people. Money was his God. He has an encounter with Jesus. He says, I'm going to give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Come on, how many know that's a big change? First day he met Jesus, big change. Look, this demoniac in Mark 5, this demon-possessed man, it says, after this, well, they came to see Jesus and they saw the one who'd been demon possessed and had the legion of demons sitting and clothed in his right mind. Come on, everybody say big change. It says, they were afraid and, and those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon possessed and about the swine. And then they began to plead with Jesus to depart from their region. And when he got in the boat, Jesus is getting in the boat to leave. If you don't want him to stay, he'll leave. And so Jesus is getting in the boat, he's leaving, and, and he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. Come on, big change. Big love, big change. He, he went from a naked, crazy man, full of demons, tormented, nobody could help him, hopeless case, to one encounter with Jesus. He's free. Come on, he's clothed, he's wearing clothes again. Can I get a good amen for that? He's wearing clothes. Some other people need to be set free from the, the demon of, of, of run around half naked. I, I, I mean, it, it's, <laughs> uh, that was extra. I, you, know, you don't have to pay nothing for that. That's just Troy. Um, but he, he want, But here's the biggest thing. He wanted to be with Jesus. Can I tell you something? That was one of the biggest changes in my life at 19 years old when when I had an encounter with Jesus' love, 
I was in that rebellious Jonas state. I mean, I was running from God. Far away from God. Prodigal son. I mean, the whole story. And when I grasped how much he loved me, one of the biggest changes with me is I wanted to be with Jesus. Come on, 19 years old, I, I, was, I would rather be, when, when, when that happened, when I had an encounter with his love, big love, and I realized how much he loved me, I would rather be in church than at the Pike Lodge. It, it, it just, it just I, I had this, I was totally free. Totally free. And big change. And, and listen, one of the things that you know you've had a big change is when you want to be with Jesus. Come on, you want to pray. You want to spend time in his word. You want to be at church. You want, you want to serve. And, and, and it's just, it speaks of discipleship. Come on, he's, he's wanting to grow. He's wanting to learn. He's wanting to be with Jesus. And in, ex, and in order to experience big change, come on, we need deliverance and discipleship. And we need them both. And, and so, big love, big change. Come on, Jesus is a deliverer. He loves to set the captives free. If you're, if you're battling today, if something torments you, listen, Jesus wants to set you free today. He, he loves long. Here's the next one. When we're, rooted in, we're, when we're rooted in big love, we love others with big love. So not only is there a big change in us, that we change. We put off the things we used to do. Come on, right after that passage in Ephesians where he said, I want you to love big. I want to pray that you're rooted and grounded in love. He said, we need to put away lying. We need to put away stealing. We need to put away sleeping around. He starts naming these things. He said, you, you've been changed. Don't do that anymore. Come on, that's who you used to be. That's not who you are. Can I get a good amen? He says, so there's a change in you, but also you'll begin to love others with big love. And, and this man, you see it in him, he wanted to go with Jesus. He's like, can I just hang out with you? Can't we just hang out in church all the time? Can't we just do another Bible study? Come on, can't we, can't we, learn, about, uh, can we learn about the end times? I'm, just, I'm really interested in those things. And Jesus says, look, uh, I know that you want to hang out, and I know you want to just hang out in church all the time and, and, and learn a little bit more and get a little bit more wisdom about the end times. But here's what I need you to do, uh, Mr. Demon Man. Uh, I, I'm not going to let you go with me. I need you to go tell everybody about what I did. But I don't know much. I've only been saved one day. He's like, yeah, go tell them that. They all know you. Go, just go show up. They know who you used to be, and they know who you are now. Come on, that's the power of testimony. That's the power of a changed life. And he said, just go tell your family. They miss you. They'll be glad to see you with clothes on. Just, just go talk to them. Go see your family. Go see your friends. And remember that, you know, everybody, the, the people there, like, wanted Jesus to leave. What's amazing is later on, Jesus came back to that same region there was about 4,000 people waiting to see Jesus. Couldn't wait till they got there. They're bringing him their sick. They're bringing him their messed up people. He ends up feeding them, feeding them all, 4,000 people. Listen, that was, how did that happen? It was the power of one man's testimony. Listen, you may not think you know enough to share Jesus' love, but listen, if he's changed your life, come on, we've experienced big love. We've got to share big love. You say, well, when, when can we stop doing that? When Jesus comes back. Because Jesus' words were, I want a full house. Even this room, we've got empty seats. Right? Isn't this great? Look around, Jesus. And he said, what I see right now, I'm thankful y'all are here, but I see empty seats. That's what I see. So go back. Go to the highways. Come on. Go to the hedges. Go, 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 to, the, go, go to Mechanic Street. Come on. Go to Varmint Trace. I need you to go to Eddyville. I need you to go to Dawson. I need you to go out in the boonies. If there's anybody who's lost, I need you to bring them in and find them so my house can be full. Can I get a good amen? Because big love... Loves others with big love. Here, here's the last one. Finally, worship team, come on. I'm going to need you to help me with this one. Especially at 9 o'clock. Y'all are tired this morning. I feel it. I feel it. Should have had more coffee. I think we might have put decaf in the pot this morning. I don't know. I think when we're rooted in big love, we worship big. Notice. 
the demoniacs, when, when he saw, look at verse 6, one sentence, when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. This guy's not even saved yet. This guy had 2,000 demons. 2,000 demons couldn't keep him from worshiping big. Come on, what's our excuse? Isn't that amazing? If he loved me that much that he would, that he would cross the sea and leave the multitudes just for me, And if he'd fight that windstorm just for me, when everybody else gave up on me, if he would come and he would do all that for me, how can I not worship big? How how can I not worship big? Come on, that's, that's that's how I feel. Jesus came a long way. Come on, if he'd leave heaven and a crowd of angels all worshiping him, to come a long way to earth to be rejected and be ridiculed and for 30 years be misunderstood and for three years of his ministry come on, people not understanding his own family didn't understand how many know he came a long way and then, and then took a beating for me and took a storm for me and, and took a cross for me and, and wouldn't let death or hell keep him from me but he rose from the dead Come on. If he would do, if he come a long way for me, then he's worthy of big worship. Come on, he's worthy of big praise. As I was studying this this week, you know, there were some theologians that were arguing this passage and they're saying, well, it really wasn't the man worshiping. It was the demons prostrating themselves before Jesus, you know, just begging him not to throw him, you know, not to cast him out of the region. It was it was the demons that were just submitted to his authority. And I'm like, okay. If a demon's smart enough to know who he is, come on. If a demon's smart enough to know that he's the son of God, that he is powerful, that he has all authority. If a demon who hasn't been redeemed, who hasn't been rescued, is smart enough to know that he is, I at least need to get on my knees and say, you're God. Then how much more we who, who have been redeemed, that have experienced and encountered his big love, should we not give him big worship.